is for, for the others that cannot join. Uh, so the, the objective for today uh, is to uh, share with you essentially, uh, I'm going to share my screen quickly, is to drive you through essentially two macro uh, sections, I would say. Um, um, one initial section is going to be about the process we are, we, are, we are thinking about using in terms of uh, uh, how to, uh, how to um, frame this research, this piece of research. And the second part is going to be about how we're going to gather inputs. So, so I think here we don't just have a challenge in terms of the research we're going to do, but there's also a big challenge in how to uh, make this research a uh, um, collaborative piece. So how to make it really uh, something where you can give a contribution and uh, it, it doesn't sound like a, a, a purely internal project. So uh, without further ado, um, uh, let's go through the, through, the, through the item. So I'm going to, uh, for, for the sake of convenience, I'm going to uh, cut and paste this, even if it's a markdown, markdown, so you may have some issues in the chat, but I'm going to share this in the chat so uh, everybody can look into the agenda uh, at any point. So, uh, I will switch to the um, Miro board that we are using to uh, 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 drive you through this. So, I don't know why it's not okay. Now it's working. Okay. So, uh, so let's start from uh, the first steps. Now, so, the first step is about, you know, uh, essentially uh, telling you what is the process, sharing with you what is the, the research and communication process we are going to follow, at, the, at least the process that we believe we are going to follow in the next uh, uh, four to six months. No? Because at the moment we have a timeline in mind that is about uh, releasing this white paper in uh, either in June or, uh, you know, I would say in the time frame between June and September. I think uh, when we started the, the, the project, there was this idea that uh, August and July are very much, you know, uh, not very active months, uh, but at the end of the day with this coronavirus outbreak, nobody knows what's gonna happen in the next few months. So, so let's say that we aim to release the white paper by June or, uh, at, you know, I would say between June and September. This is the time frame for the release, okay? So uh, in terms of process, um, what we're going to do, we're going to run uh, community sense making calls. So what are these community sense making calls? Uh, uh, we, we have this idea to run monthly calls where essentially uh, like these, like the one that you're attending now, where we are going to essentially uh, have conversations. And these conversations are going to be uh, focused on uh, the content that we produce uh, during the uh, research. So. Uh, uh, what, what are we thinking about is that uh, in, be, in between, let's say during the, the research uh, work, we are going to release often and, and uh, quickly to the community our major insights. And we are going to do this through mainly through two uh, uh, tools. So let me, let me share with you the, uh, the, uh, the first one of these, one of those, which is uh, the research update. So probably you have, been, you have seen that uh, a couple of days ago, we, uh, let me just make some room for, for this. So a couple of days ago, we shared uh, our first research update on the, on the blog. And in our first research update, as you can see, uh, research update number one, uh, we are basically uh, uh, sharing um, uh, our progress in terms of, uh, in, this, in this specific case, in terms of the compass that we're using. So, uh, in this research update, we shared our main questions that we mapped in the last um, few weeks. So when we started this research, we said, you know, uh, first of all, let's try to understand what are the questions that uh, stand for us. And uh, we're going to go through this uh, in a minute, uh, but essentially we mapped uh, uh, six areas and uh, a few uh, questions for each area. So we're going to get back into the research compass, but just to tell you more about the research update. So the research update is going to cons consolidate all the steps that we are taking, all the insights. So in this case, for example, you can find a, a, a quite thorough description of the research areas that we identified. 
And uh, in this case, there was also uh, an update on how to engage with us. And essentially, uh, again, we're going to touch uh, base on this in a few minutes, but here we describe the process to become a contributor of the white paper. And also we have announcements and we, uh, uh, and uh, okay, this also gives me the opportunity to thank uh, Marco, which is in, uh, Gianmarco, which is in the call uh, from our, uh, at the moment, the unique uh, sponsor uh, for this project, Intesa San Paolo. Uh, so again, Gianmarco, thanks for coming with, uh, with us in the call today. Uh, uh, thank you for the invitation. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. So, Intesa San Paolo is at the moment the, the main, the only sponsor to this uh, white paper, but it's also a good, uh, a good thing to say that we are still looking for more sponsors and more sponsors are considering the investment because they believe that this research is essential to their organizational development. So again, uh, thanks Intesa for, for joining us and looking forward to have more companies on board. Um, and uh, yeah, basically this is the typical research update. You know, it's a short update. We're going to do this at least bi-weekly, but most likely we're going to have more than, more than one research update every two weeks. So this is going to be uh, uh, one of the topics of discussion. Another topic of discussion is going to be the, the podcasts that we're going to release. So in the plan of uh, um, the research, uh, we have plan to interview experts and uh, um, uh, ex experts of, I would say, two kinds. Uh, uh, first of all, we are going to interview uh, thinkers or writers or people that uh, we believe uh, have uh, interesting ideas to share. Sometimes there will be not necessarily people that are operating in the space of ecosystems and platform thinking, but maybe, you know, I don't know, it can be people that are, um, are working on other aspects. So for example, so far, we performed two interviews that we're gonna publish in the next uh, few weeks and more, more are planned already. I will tell you more in a minute. But for example, we interviewed Arthur Brock, Brock from Holochain, uh, uh, the founder, basically the, the chief designer of Holochain. So uh, it's a technologist, not necessarily a platform expert. And uh, Thomas Dietz, uh, which is uh, one of the fathers of Fab City project. So it's uh, probably uh, one of the most advanced experts in digital fabrication and, and, and distributed manufacturing. So as you can see, we're not necessarily talking with platforms and ecosystems experts, but we're talking with people that uh, uh, we believe can contribute insights in terms of how to frame the transformations that are setting the stage for the next generation of platforms. So that's one type of interviews that we are doing. And those interviews are, are those that are more likely to be published through uh, podcasting because they have a generally interest that goes even beyond platform thinking. And on the other hand, we are also in interviewing experts like scholars or, or researchers that maybe don't end up in being published as a, a podcast. Also, for example, uh, people from companies, you know, something like that, um, that will still provide us with information and knowledge that we're gonna factor in into the white paper, but not necessarily get published as a podcast interviews. So uh, just, just let me mention that in our pipeline of interviews, we have amazing people like, you know, Misha Bowens. Tonight I'm going to interview James Carrier that you probably uh, have heard about. And, uh, you know, many other people like Anna Angelic. Uh, we have, uh, let me think about Joe Norman uh, from uh, Real World Risk Institute. So many, many people that we're going to interview in the next few weeks. And uh, we're going to have a steady release I believe at least again bi-weekly uh, until June of uh, podcast interviews that you can enjoy. So this content will be the base for the conversation. So we, we look at the community sense making calls, not as uh, today, you know, today most likely will be we sharing our approach and we sharing our plans, but in the next coming uh, community sense making calls, we wanna have conversations. We wanna have open space for, you know, critics, questions, uh, insights. So we, we strongly believe that conversational medium uh, is uh, the, the, the real sense-making medium. So, so we, we want to host these two hours as a space to, to, to comment uh, uh, the content that we'll be publishing, new ideas, and let you also express your, your suggestions. 
So this is what the community sense making call is gonna be. And uh, in terms of uh, um, uh, getting noticed about the, the dates, we're going to publish a calendar. So you can click again, but basically we're gonna make a calendar of calls and with links of clickable uh, uh, calendar events that you can put in your calendar. And, uh, and also if you join one of the spaces where uh, we are going to um, host our community, you can get noticed. So let me get back quickly on this topic exactly. So the, the how to become part of the community. So at the moment we released two, two and sorry for the kids uh, in the background, you know, with this coronavirus uh, quarantine, <laughs> we, we all work from home. So I, I guess this is gonna be a common issue. So, so coming back to how do you become part of the community? So essentially we have shared two forms. One is the so-called expression of interest form. So it's a form that you can find, for example, in our uh, um, uh, initial blog post where we describe the white paper. So uh, the, uh, more specifically, the, the blog post called the new foundations of platforms and ecosystems thinking. So this one here, there is a link to this blog form, as you can see. And uh, so basically this form is about expressing your interest as becoming part of the community. So most of you already did this, okay? So you, you, you are here also because we communicated to, to, to you through your expression of interest. There's another form that some of you have been compiling called the early signal form. Uh, actually, uh, this is not uh, really up to date, but let me see if I can show you uh, the, real, uh, the real one. Uh, yes, it should be here. So as you can see, is the uh, form where you can submit your case study suggestions and some of your uh, initial suggestions that we are factoring in in this initial phase. So we believe that this form, ah, sorry, I think my screen sharing is paused, so you can see that. So um, this form here is called the white paper early signal form. So some of you already contributed. I see, for example, Marc Antoine or Ivan, uh, Renz as well. So, uh, so we got your suggestions in terms of what technologies we should consider, technologies or, or social trends, what case studies or what ex experts we should interview. So this, is, this form, I believe, is, is designed to be mostly used in this initial, uh, initial moment. Uh, because of what? Because we believe that essentially uh, your, your involvement uh, uh, in the second phase, let's say in the more intense phase of, co of collaboration needs to go, to go through the Discord channel. So you basically contributing to this form, you end up in a mailing list that we are going to um, uh, keep updated and communicate through this mailing list all the time. But most importantly, you, become, uh, you should become part of the Discord channel. So uh, here's the Discord channel that we created a few weeks ago. It's, a, it's an experiment for us. We have been using a lot of tools. And in the meantime, in this last few weeks, we are also ramping up our community of practice effort, more generally for Platform Design Toolkit. And we wanted to test Discord as a tool for collaboration. As you know, most of you are also in our a Telegram channel, especially those of you that have been attending some of our trainings, you end up in a Telegram community channel. But this channel, this Discord is going to be really the space where we look after collaborating. So this is where we're going to have conversations, where we're going to share files and so on. And so if you're not part of the Discord, uh, uh, sorry, the Discord channel yet, please reach out and uh, maybe you can also write in the chat and we're going to share with you the link. So I think, Stina, maybe you can also, in the meantime, if you don't mind, share the link to the, to the Discord the channel in the chat, if you don't mind. So here is where yes. we're gonna, we, thank you. Here is where we're gonna have the col main collaboration uh, across this uh, whole project. Uh, okay, so basically this is the way you get in, the onboarding um, form at the moment, and then you, uh, uh, you join the Discord. And, and uh, I would say uh, after the Discord, so in this part, uh, you start to really be part of the collaboration, okay? So coming back to the, uh, to the agenda. So... Simone, wait. I just got reminded we haven't shared the Myro link, so should I share that as well? Yeah, 
At the moment, the MyroLink is uh, just as um, uh, it's just a consult. Uh, con uh, you can just view it, so you cannot collaborate on the MyroLink. Now, MyroLink is going to be something where we can just put our uh, nodes so that everybody knows where things are. There, there are, there are clickable links, uh, and we're going to ensure that the MyroBoard is the place where you can all have visual um, elements and uh, all the links all together. Okay. So, this is about the community sense making call, uh, podcast, research updates, early access to content. So, of course, if you have become part of the discords, for example, you're going to have also early access to uh, drafts, uh, ideas, uh, early access to podcasting, probably, and so on. So, if you really want to be, uh, you want to be uh, on top of the news, you, you should really be on the, on the, the Discord uh, channel. So, if there is no question on this part, I'm gonna move into the research compass and share with you uh, the research questions we are, we are dealing with at the moment. Okay, so I will go. So again, when you wanna speak, if you wanna ask something, just uh, don't worry too much about interrupting me and just uh, maybe you can raise your hand. That would be also uh, interesting. And then we can leave you the, the flow. So in terms of the research compass, uh, again, as I said, the research compass is uh, totally described in this, no, sorry, not this one, but it's totally described in this blog post. So I, 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 I think you should um, read this and if you wanna have more complete understanding. But uh, uh, let's, sorry, let's look into the uh, uh, questions for, uh, uh, for a moment. So as you can see, there is a first central uh, uh, research area that we call shifting the platform idea. Hmm? This uh, research, uh, or maybe let me spend a few moments, a few words first on the uh, overall access. So first of all, we started by describing these three axes of the research. So we believe uh, uh, strongly that uh, this research project uh, needs to move along and needs to frame platforms and ecosystem thinking uh, along these three lines, these three axes. One is the technological access, uh, axis. So uh, we mean in terms of, uh, you know, for example, new technologies, uh, not just new technologies coming up, but also, for example, how do we develop new technologies through platform thinking? So uh, ecosystemic technologies. Uh, let me make an example, for example, think about how uh, Google developed the Android operating system as a, as a an alliance, including many companies. So that's more or less the idea. And also so to study both the, uh, how new technologies are changing the game and also how new technologies can be created by different uh, ways, in different ways. On the other hand, we have the biosphere uh, axis, which uh, you probably are familiar with all these issues that we have to deal with in terms of uh, uh, you know, climate change impact or ecosystemic collapse now, uh, coronavirus, all these, uh, uh, you know, uh, big risk factors that we are seeing emerging, you know, as we uh, face the limits of our biosphere. And on the other hand, we have the cultural uh, evolution uh, layer, which is definitely important. It's about how human culture have been evolving in the last millennia. Uh, what is the role of cultural evolution and regeneration in, uh, in rethinking the role of uh, platforms and ecosystem? So these are the three main axes. And some of these questions, as you can see, are more uh, central. So they more or less uh, relate with the whole set of axes. Some of them are a little bit more scattered across this radar. Mm -hmm. So if we start from the core of the questions and the core of the research area uh, areas, I would say that we have uh, this central area called uh, shifting the platform idea. And the big, again, uh, you know, the big questions related to this idea is really about uh, how do we define and perceive uh, 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 this uh, thing that we describe by using the word platforms and ecosystem. So the big question here is, uh, uh, we use platforms and ecosystems to describe something, but what are we talking about for real? So what are the, um, uh, 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 how is this platform idea uh, 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 reshaping and evolving itself? So we, everything started by, you know, talking about these Airbnbs and the Ubers and these new consumer, direct-to-consumer companies. But at the end of the day, 
uh, we, we know very well, everybody here in this call knows very well that uh, these transition and changes are really about uh, 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 more, more like a mindset and an approach uh, uh, to organizational development, think, thinking about human systems uh, at scale than actually Uber or Airbnb. So that's one part of the question. Another part of the question is essentially also about trying to understand if our um, uh, if our uh, epistemological tools are enough to understand what's happening. So, so there is also a big question in terms Okay, seems like Simone is frozen at the moment. Yeah, it's also for me. Me too. Okay, I will write to him. So I think the the networks are can be a bit overloaded these days. Yeah, that's going to be a problem for a while, I would think. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I had yesterday problems. Today, is, so far, it's been good. But he should come back. Should we cut video, maybe? Soon. Should most of us cut video, yeah. maybe? I think we can all, yeah. And we can maybe switch it on later on when we talk uh, in the discussion. Ça fait longtemps, on s'est pas vu. Uh... Depuis l'année dernière. En effet, bonjour. <laughs> I'm writing to him on Telegram to see. Um. Ah. You're muted, Simone. Ah, you're still okay, muted. sorry, I'm back. Uh, you want to believe me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, we just said that we can close our cameras uh, until the discussion. No, we can just but open it. Let me, but let me explain what happened. Actually, it's not even a, a network failure. It was a power failure. So, so now <laughs> I, I'm going to reconnect to the Wi-Fi as, as uh, soon as it gets back into, into operation. But uh, it's not a big deal. So if you can hear me, I can go for a few... few few seconds like this and then we switch to the Wi-Fi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes. Okay, there is a bit of delay. So so be patient for a few minutes and then I will shift to the few a few seconds and then I will shift to the more uh, the more uh, resilient network. So let me get back to the conversation. Okay, so as I was saying, so basically the question is uh, not just about what we describe with these uh, words, but also how do we sense make uh, all these changes that we are witnessing um, and how do we uh, describe essentially what we, we what we perceive how do we uh, how do we uh, epistemologically uh, are we epistemologically tool to deal with such questions so this is more or less the area that we uh, that we call uh, shifting the platform idea. Yeah, oh, is your, also about uh, the design and development. It's quite the poor sound. Yeah, it's a really crappy connection somewhere. I think he is connecting on mobile. Oh. 
Okay, so. Okay, so he's off again. Oh, here you are. Are you back on Wi Fi? Uh, you're mute. We should be back to normal now, right? Yes. Yes. Okay, sorry about that. Again, it was a power failure, so not even a network failure that would have been more common in these coronavirus days. <laughs> so let's get back to the flow. So, as, as I was saying, you know, the question here is uh, um, it's not just about, you know, how we perceive uh, uh, platforms thinking and how we describe it, but also how we engage with the very, very um, same design and development process. So, for example, you know, or how do we design, how do we create co-design processes that engage uh, new types of constituencies? And what does it mean to develop a platform idea from, uh, for example, from the perspective of uh, a um, community and not, uh, not from the perspective, for example, of an entrepreneurial team? And what does it mean to enterprise in this new um, context? So these are all questions that make up the shifting the platform idea uh, topic. Uh, so before I move into the next research area, again, I encourage you guys to use the camera. It's not a bandwidth issue, it was a power issue. So I would love to see your faces if you don't, uh, if you don't mind. Can I, can I ask a question or make a statement? Yeah. In terms of this research, um, and uh, let's, uh, I'm focusing particularly on the term platform thinking mm -hmm. and or platform business models or the word platforms. Um, I understand it and I think, uh, you know, the people here and people in this area generally understand it, but I've often wondered uh, about whether there's a short, simple explanation of the notion of platform, not, not, particularly in a technological sense, but in a sociological sense, and I believe that's what's intended at the end of the day, um, whether it has been expressed somewhere in very simple terms that non-technologists and non-specialists um, in this area would, uh, would understand clearly, because I think you know, we're moving into a world of platforms for different things. I think there were platforms before, but they were just um, differently conceived, perhaps uh, on an um, ideological level or something like that. And I'm not sure I'm making sense. I just always wonder whether people uh, more widely understand what is meant by a platform mm -hmm. and platform thinking and platform dynamics, etc. Yeah, let me say that uh, um, in our work uh, so far, we always uh, expressed uh, this uh, idea of platforms in a social technical way. So we never have um, spoken about uh, platforms in terms of uh, just technologies, but uh, always in terms of uh, um, uh, at least uh, the mix of three things, which is uh, the technological infrastructure part, then there is the governance and language part, and then there is a narrative and message part. So there are these three. You've frozen again. I've understood that. I, I probably didn't make my question clear mm -hmm. enough, so let's forget it. Okay, well, I'm here if you wanna expand more, eh? but I, I'm going to also take note of the questions that emerge, uh, that emerge here. Um, then second, uh, the second area is what we call policies and risk. And uh, it's a, a one A, if you can, if you see, because there is also one B and I'm going to tell you more why we grouped them all together. Hmm? So essentially the, the risk uh, uh, area is uh, essentially focused on understanding how uh, new uh, risk factors and policies. So on one hand, you have risks which are uh, essentially coming up out of systems. So it's not something we are uh, advocating about, it's something that happens. <laughs> and for this, uh, we have a big, uh, uh, um, I would say, um, uh, uh, 
uh, lighthouse that is the work that uh, some not just these institutions but for example the world economic forum is doing every year with the global risk report you know? so that kind of risk is the set of risks for example that we identified as uh, uh, risks that we want to understand so the question is about how do this risk factor uh, reshape for example the, the value chain so so uh, what does it mean for example to have a pandemic uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, the uh, how this shapes and reshapes the idea of what a platform is and what kind of ecosystems and platforms we want to leverage on and we can uh, and we can motivate and we can uh, uh, i would say uh, organize so that's the, the one part of the question the other part of the question is about uh, uh, um, uh, essentially is about policies so not uh, uh, not just uh, uh, elements that uh, um, i would say are projected on our idea of platforms from the system uh, by the system but uh, also what elements are coming up from the governance system so, so so what kind of policies policy makers are going to enforce for example in terms of uh, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, there's an error here, but essentially CO2 reduction policies, for example, or uh, circular economy, or now more than ever, uh, relocation. So, for example, there is a big trend that policymakers are going to most likely act upon after and during this pandemic about reducing the uh, dependencies on uh, global supply chains. So we can expect policies to act to work in a certain way and the question here is uh, how do we can fact how can we factor in these policies in and how do they reshape the landscape of platforms and ecosystems thinking and we believe strongly that these green post-its that you see here uh, in in parallel with these green post-its that you see here uh, can can be uh, analyzed through the lens of uh, uh, value chain analysis and for those of you that are familiar uh, we are talking about uh, some work that we did already in the past for example when uh, uh, factoring in the impact of blockchain and artificial intelligence uh, and uh, this uh, image is coming from a, a, a seminal blog post that we released in 2019 in january uh, that was essentially a first uh, uh, attempt to understand uh, how these new technologies like blockchain and ai uh, uh, could uh, uh, transform the landscape of platform thinking and it's a it's a rather long process uh, sorry rather long blog that you can check uh, check out and it has a description of for example how we believe that these kind of policies on technological elements can be assessed from the point of view of value chain analysis so that's how we're gonna fact uh, how we're gonna manage uh, uh, policies and risk and technology and new technologies in terms of how they impact the value chain, how they change the rule of platform thinking. Then, um, uh, area number two is the area of cultural change. Um, so here we are asking, you know, uh, essentially what are the cultural shifts that we are uh, perceiving and uh, how these cultural shifts are going to impact platforms and ecosystems thinking in terms of, uh, for example, the intention that platform owners uh, are going to have and uh, uh, how they, uh, for example, how uh, um, new cultural trend such as regenerative, uh, regenerative thinking is going to, uh, to impact platform thinking. So in this area, we, what we want to um, factor in is really about uh, how uh, cultural evolution is happening at the moment uh, at uh, uh, even more, uh, uh, at even faster pace, we believe, because of the big changes that we are all part of so the question here is if i can if i can uh, uh, you know you know if i can make a um, i would say a um, quick point is about how the human system is going to respond in terms of new narratives new stories new cultural elements that emerge and that we need to understand and we need to factor in uh, area number three is about platform institutions so what we want to understand here is um, is how essentially the existing system, the existing uh, uh, system of uh, organizations and institutions that we have is going to resonate, change, transform, uh, uh, bounce, uh, respond, integrate this new potential. So we're talking about many, many things here. We're talking about 
how uh, um, uh, essentially how existing institutions are going to transform, how they're going to integrate and use uh, these new possibilities to explore the future. So not just respond, but also actively, uh, I would say, propose the changes by embracing this new mindset, these new possibilities, but also what kind of new institutions to core are going to emerge. I think we, um, uh, I think Indy Joar said uh, many times that we are living through this uh, uh, new space between the private and the uh, you know, new emerging space between the private and the, and the public. So what comes out of this new space, what new entrepreneurial platform, what is the meaning of entrepreneurship in terms of creating new institutions? So that's, I would say, a big, big part of our research. Uh, I, you know, from my personal point of view, I think this is the, key, uh, uh, is the key aim of this research, is really to understand what, what happens to organizing. Uh, uh, Gianmarco is here in the call, and I, once I had a chance to speak at a, at a key event at um, uh, Intesa San Paolo, and uh, you know, uh, I, I shared this idea that, for example, institutions like uh, banks or, or in general government institutions that are used to deal with organizations, we need to understand how to deal with organizing. So, so there is this new flourishing of new possibilities of organizing and there are big, big uh, issues, big, big uh, changes that need to happen. So the idea is really to understand what happens to our institutions in this uh, 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 secular and uh, you know, uh, very fast transformation. So that's the, the, the uh, area number three. And uh, let's move into the area number four which is the last one, uh, and it's about market, markets and industries. So here I would say it's the more, probably the more uh, mundane <laughs> part of the research, uh, uh, the one that may be a little bit more allergic for, for, for change makers. Uh, uh, but the question here is really about what are the new opportunities? So how do we organize markets? How do we reorganize uh, uh, services, products? Uh, um, uh, how do we, for example, how do we use uh, ecosystems thinking to create new technologies and to create new uh, 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 infrastructures? So, so, for example, how do we create the internet of the future? How do we create, for example, one of the big, big case studies that we have been interviewing and that we're going to consolidate also probably in a blog post in the coming weeks is Open Compute Project. It's an amazing project about how do we build data centers on the internet uh, and uh, uh, it's about uh, 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 hundreds of companies coalescing around this uh, governance uh, uh, process to create sustainable data centers to uh, increase the reusability and the sustainability of, of our internet. So those are the kind of things that we want to investigate in this area. What are the opportunities? How do we transform the 80% uh, uh, of the consumer uh, market spending that is not yet organized in platforms, uh, you know, or at least what is going to remain after the coronavirus outbreak? <laughs> and, and, you know, essentially, how do we reorganize how we exchange value, money, uh, sorry, services, products, and, and uh, marketplaces? So this is a, another big area, and that's more or less uh, all about our um, our uh, um, our compass. Mm -hmm. Again, if there are no questions, I'm going to move on with the agenda. Uh, I don't know if you have any questions or, or something that you want to share in terms of something that we may have forgotten, or you know something that we overlooked, or or, or something that uh, you want just to to share as a, a as an opinion. I'm going ahead in any, if, if there's no interruption. Okay, so coming back to our agenda. Um, uh, sorry, I, I cannot, oh, well, I lost the agenda. So let's see if I can I get it back from the card because I, I, was, uh, I was kicked out of the call. I can paste it. Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much. That the, would be the, great. The next step is the case study structure. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks very much. So, case study structure. So, uh, we, with uh, with Stina, we spent quite a lot of time trying to frame what a case study is, because uh, 
you know, uh, it's not so easy to say, you know, this is a case study, this is not. So case studies may be new companies or, you know, uh, you can think about uh, Airbnb as a case study, you can think about uh, Holochain as a case study, but at the end of the day, for example, if you focus on, uh, let's think about three case studies that we, we definitely believe would be part of the research. You know? So on one hand you have Airbnb, a classic, on one hand you have Holochain, on the other hand you have Hiya. Uh, so in that case, Airbnb is, a, is, a, is an organization, but it's also a product, it's a brand. So somehow there is this uh, um, idea of a product company. On the other hand, you have Hiya that is, uh, 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 an organization. So it's not even a product, it's more like uh, an organizational structure. But then on the other hand, you have all the chain uh, that is a technology, okay? So we, we try to break down the types of uh, case studies that we probably going to, uh, uh, going to see. And I, I think we lost some uh, 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 labels here, if I'm not wrong. But essentially, we have uh, we uh, uh, and uh, here I'm going organization, to... society, and emerging. Exactly. Other three. Thanks very much. So we label them as uh, uh, organizations. So an organizational case study, society. So an experiment that comes from either the government, governments or institutions or uh, communities or, or, but in general, I would say more related to uh, um, uh, institutional initiatives, like for example, you know, a policy making effort uh, or, uh, uh, you know, um, a, a, an effort for a government, for example, to create uh, platforms to um, organize uh, social contributions. And finally, the last uh, case study, um, uh, um, uh, sorry, Stina, can you remind me the name? Emerging. Here? Emerging. So, so uh, whatever else it's emerging that is hard to um, frame through the layer of private organizations or, or public or, or you know, collaborative institutions. So here, that would be the space, for example, where we uh, frame uh, Orochain. Uh, so again, uh, we don't believe that these labels, these labels are gonna be, you know, accurate, huh? but it's just a way to more or less distribute the type of case studies that we are looking for. Huh? So organizational case studies, societal case studies, institutional ones, emerging projects, emerging initiatives, something that uh, it's hard to taxonomize, no? especially because they are emerging. So that's something new by, the, by definition. Um, when it comes to the analyzing the case uh, study, uh, we are using this uh, uh, framing. So uh, let me, let me uh, uh, I think this uh, uh, one needs to be refreshed. Be patient. Yeah. Okay. This may be as. Uh, let me show you the the, the, the direct link. So uh, and let me uh, take the chance to explain that those of you that go through the Discord can ask direct access to this document. So we're counting on you to be active contributors. So not to be just watching what happens in the in the background. No, you need to contribute, and of course every contribution would be accounted, make it make, made public, you will be mentioned as contributors to the publication, similarly to what, you know, for example, uh, uh, our dearest uh, Alex Ostervade did with Business Model Generation. So it's a collaborative project. I think we're really looking for having a stronger contribution. We need to learn together with you. So be patient if something doesn't work, try to be constructive, but our intention is to work together with you guys. So. Uh, what kind of uh, uh, description are we gonna use? Uh, how are we gonna describe a case study? So for sure, you will see that there is a name of the case study, a uh, country, you know, for example, in this case, it's the US, the contributor that suggested the case study, uh, the type of uh, uh, um, case study. So as, as we said uh, just a few seconds ago, we're talking about organization, society, or emerging case study here. 
a, a quick uh, introduction, like a few lines. And then there are two macro aspects. So first of all, we're going to ask you to understand and to describe how this uh, case study and you, not just asking you, because this is work that we are going to do, of course, if uh, nobody else contributes that. <laughs> But in general, as a group, as a team, as a, as a community, we need to answer those questions, we believe, which are essentially the, the questions of how these strategies, these elements, these case studies resonate with uh, common platform expression elements. This is what we call. So what is a common platform expression element? You can go to the glossary and you will see that uh, a common platform uh, uh, expression element, uh, uh, well, actually, this, uh, this is not on the glossary because it's self sorry, it's a self explain But essentially, it's, it's about, you know, how, for example, this case study uh, reduced the cost of transaction in, in, with a mechanism such as a P2P marketplace. How this uh, case study uh, um, creates and enforce a uh, common language of protocol. So these are the seven recurring expression of platform thinking that we wanted to investigate in the case study. So for example, how does the governance model work? What are the key elements of the learning engine? What is the narrative of expanded opportunity? How it reduces the barriers to entry in terms of production and consumption? and how it leverages the, the social capital and the reputation. So these, uh, we believe, are seven recurring common expressions of platform elements. So uh, basically the idea is for us that every case study that is really relevant needs to resonate with these seven recurring uh, uh, you know, modes of expression of platform thinking. Mm -hmm. So we would, we would uh, need to describe how this works. I'm not looking into the chat. So Stina, if you can keep an eye, if there are questions that are relevant for me, just let me know. Then uh, the research compass questions. So for each of these uh, uh, projects, as you can see, there are several lines. So for example, open compute has several lines here, but not all the lines uh, essentially uh, um, uh, have this description because uh, you can use several lines to add how the uh, project resonates, uh, the case study resonates with uh, uh, the compass questions. So here you have the seven, the six research areas, markets and industry, shifting the platform idea, policies and risk, role, and te role of tech, cultural change and platform institutions. And then here you have all the uh, questions. So ideally, what you should do is, you know, if you want to describe a case study, try to understand how the case study maps with the research areas. So you say, for example, open compute project, uh, uh, you know, as a, is something that we need to understand from the point of view of uh, uh, markets and industries. So how a business ecosystem is uh, um, uh, now creating a new technology and open compute project is essentially, uh, of course, one of the main uh, um, case studies that are teaching us and telling us how new technologies can be developed. All the data you find in the, in the table now is uh, really uh, initial. Also, we're starting now the research these days. So it don't, you know, don't expect that what you find now is final. We're still working on the case studies that you find as uh, you know, led by boundaryless team. And then in the rest of the, uh, of the file, you find already a list of case studies that we have identified. And some others are uh, case studies that you guys have identified. So we, we still didn't have the chance to put the names here, but we will do that. Or you can do that. If you ask access to the file, you can do your own, uh, you can add yourself where you are. For example, you know, for example, I don't know, um, I think uh, uh, common stack was suggested by, uh, uh, I don't know if Renzo or uh, Pascal, that is not in the call, I believe. Uh, uh, yes, that was me, Simona, yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So Renzo, you can add yourself here and say, okay, this is my case study I suggested, and then you can, uh, you can start to add information here. Sorry, Simone, uh, one question here from Marc Antoine, if we can contribute with planned initiatives or, or only ongoing ones? Maybe if you want to specify the question more, Marc Antoine. Yeah, okay. yeah, I mean, again, uh, I don't think we have any hard, hard answer to this. So if you believe that a case study is relevant, uh, even if it's planned, uh, in general, I think it's much more interesting to 
uh, um, analyze existing initiatives because you know they have already something that we can uh, assess and we can have opinions about but if a particularly planned uh, um, uh, initiative is interesting for example it may have already a governance model uh, that is outlined in the intention so so why not you know so really uh, we're looking forward in general for meaningful contributions and then uh, uh, I, we trust you guys that you can say, you know, this is important, uh, you need to feature this, you need to study this, we need to uh, uh, talk about this because it's interesting and important. Thank you. So that's it. Uh, okay, so that's more or less the, the, the file. Uh, any other, I see maybe there are other questions I can... Uh, 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 yes, yes. Uh, uh, it's one hour into the call, so um, let's check where we are with the um, uh, with the agenda. And uh, yeah, I think we more or less finished the process part, so we can have a quick break uh, for a for a for a glass of water. Unless there is another question on this part, I would uh, move into a five minutes break and then start again with the second leg of the of the call. Sorry, Simone, just a quick question about the, uh, the type of question there are in the white paper. So is it possible or uh, is it suitable to add questions that might come in the case study analysis that might be suitable for the white paper or maybe it can be a place where we can share like interview uh, guide questions that we applied in a case study? Uh, yes, of course. I mean, in terms of how do we, uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, questions that we, um, uh, to guide your case study analysis, I think it's more or less the structure of the Excel file that we identified. But everything is subject to feedback and conversation. So my suggestion would be to use the Discord channel to join the Discord. So we can have a day-to-day -day conversation and maybe you can say, you, you know, guys, I know that uh, I've have, I had these uh, new questions in mind that maybe it's important to share. So, uh, uh, so you know, nothing is written in stone. Also, uh, let's remember that the research compass is just a compass. So uh, it's just what is guiding our inquiry at the moment. But this is definitely subject to change, be adapted, be updated. So we look forward to uh, critical analysis and new questions and new suggestions to, to edit and change uh, everything in the process. Okay, so my suggestion, will be, my suggestion will be to really use the, the Discord channel to have these uh, conversations. Okay. Okay, so let's have a, a, a quick, uh, um, a quick uh, um, break, five minutes break. So I'm going to put a timer here so you can see where, uh, how, how long do you have. So I'll see you in uh, five minutes.
Okay. Okay, so hope your uh, quick uh, coffee break was, uh, <laughs> was good. Sorry, um, just one uh, question, Simone, maybe, because yeah. so now uh, Ranzo asked for permission no, to access the file. Mm -hmm. um, so should we, how, in which way should we do it? I think, uh, Renzo, you should uh, communicate uh, the email and uh, we're going to um, give you personal access to the, web, to the file. So, so that's how we do it. We're going to have this file open to, to single co contributors that want to do uh, direct work on the file. So you will have all access to the file. So we're going to do it through uh, directly giving you access through email. And um, yeah, perfect. So you can do it either on the channel or writing directly to me or Stina on Discord, and we're gonna give you access. Okay. Thanks. Uh, okay, so uh, quickly coming back to the agenda, um, we are moving into uh, essentially, uh, so I think some of these things we already covered. Um, so uh, maybe uh, Stina, you want to share uh, the, uh, so basically when it comes to moving from the early signal to the sustained collaboration, this is what we have uh, briefly introduced before. So you can contribute to the forms and then um, uh, once you become part of the Discord channel, you really become part of the collaboration space. And then from, from there, you can really start to contribute to the research. So basically to the case studies. But again, I wanna stress one point here that uh, at the moment you can contribute through the analysis of the case studies, but this doesn't mean that in the future, the contribution will be limited to contributing case studies. So this is where we are at the moment. We are uh, compiling a set of case studies, but maybe in the next weeks so we're going to move into, I don't know, uh, any you know, collectively writing part of the white paper, or illustrations or whatever you um, you believe you know we believe we can leverage on your contribution in a sensible and uh, um, and in a, a meaningful way hmm? so uh, we spoke about this so maybe stina and uh, the next step for me would be to uh, give, you know for example giving you a, a quick uh, review of the input that we received so far so in the early signal and uh, basically, we are going to move. Uh, uh, we are going to move into. Um, uh, sorry, we are going to do this uh, uh, update on the early signals uh, periodically, uh, at least as, as long as we use the early signal form. So, Sina, do you want to go five minutes through the presentation that you prepared uh, for the for the call? Yeah, sure. And we can also say that. I mean, we will share this um i'm sorry i'm, I'm starting to add people so please just be patient that you will get access to the file uh, <laughs> afterwards um so what we try to do is not really like an analysis it's uh, it's just like a, a recap of what we of what we got um so basically we had I think there was just a one response coming in today, which is not taken into account here. We had five uh, requests, so someone had difficulties? Yeah, now you are breaking up a little, but now it works. Okay. So the first question was on the social technological impacts. And we had five responses, so you, you will also see that we will share all the details. But just some of the headlines uh, that we found uh, was this thing of new technologies being more and more interconnected. And this allows for new opportunities to for further fragmentation and on the other end, um, aggregation and collaboration for this decentralized production across devices, across technologies um, and objects. Um, this also means the new growth opportunities through the combination of online and offline uh, platforms. So, for example, co-working spaces, and this gives rise to new 
uh, hybrid models that can create additional network effects, but also new challenges for governance and management of, of platform. Uh, and then what we sensed from the responses is that the new platform model, let's say, uh, is not clear at the moment, but it's something that is emerging more or less on the edges of different evolutions. So for example, through autonomous governance protocols and token systems uh, that enable this democratization of control and breaking up of uh, large organizations. So here, I'm not gonna go into the details, but we will share the PDF um, export in the, in the Discord channel as well. But these were the questions related to the social technological trends and impact. One thing that might was not captured in the uh, summary was this opportunity also when uh, the suppliers in the supply chain become more visible, that there's an opportunity to leverage on the trend for demand for sustainability or, or certain uh, production practices uh, that the consumers will have a, an increased um, visibility and power to, to demand certain um, desirable practices. So for the case studies, uh, we saw an interest in this uh, nature inspired design like biomimicry and also biotechnology DIY. Uh, so really we are sensing that we need to look more into this, how living systems can inspire ecosystem uh, thinking. Uh, there's also interest in what we already described before, how we organize the case studies, uh, because that will have an impact on how we, we frame also the, the white paper. Um, and at the same time, coming back maybe to the question that was posted in the chat earlier, that uh, those community-led initiatives, citizen-led initiatives, uh, how do they compare to those more technology, new te emerging technology um, initiatives? So this is, and again, some suggestions are, uh, again, on how incumbents uh, platformize and how startups uh, basically scale with network effects. So we have some different links and um ideas that we have also put in the excel file and um yeah that's it and we also got some um suggestions on who to interview so the biohack community uh, richard bartlett if people are familiar with and jeff emmett so here we are also indicated where we got the response that the person who answered the survey could potentially introduce us. Um, and some other suggestions that came in was a, a little bit around the methodology. So how to evolve basically the different canvases and uh, a desire to contribute, which was, is very nice. Uh, and also different uh, references to look into. So, so that's basically what, what we, got from the community service so far which we will share after after the call mm -hmm. and let me say that there was one contribution that we didn't make uh, in yeah. time to add uh, i think a mark and one's uh yeah contribution. so we we can incorporate it before we yeah share. yeah yeah we do that as i said we will do this periodically as long as it makes sense you know because maybe at some point we transition uh, beyond the form into some more direct way to engage you know when if we succeed to have a more uh, cohesive uh, a, a group of contributors so it will be easier to onboard the new contributors through the to the discord uh, channel and so on yeah another thing that i wanted to mention that uh, came to my mind after the conversation that stina uh, uh, guided is that of course uh, uh, this white paper will end up in new tools that's for sure at the moment is not the focus of the research to uh, dive directly into tools but we can definitely imagine that after a six months uh, research process, we will end up with the new areas of interest for the design. And as you can, uh, uh, as you can uh, imagine, uh, um, so basically um, tools, uh, um, sorry, I got distracted from a message in the chat, but yeah, basically this is the idea. No, we don't want to rush into tools, but we will, uh, 
surely incorporate all these new uh, uh, contributions and ideas into new tools that uh, uh, that yeah the, the point that i wanted to make is that uh, as you remember one of the questions in the in the research compass is also about the evolution of the design process and the question here is not just about tools but also processes of design so we are quite conscious that uh, this is going to be part of the conversation how to evolve the um, the, uh, the whole design process and also the tools so one quick comment on why we don't share the file directly uh, uh, it's because there are some emails and as you know uh, the idea is not to share uh, emails but uh, we also we also um, uh, considered to just hide a column of the file so that uh, uh, you guys don't uh, need to wait to see the email. You know, maybe for the first time we, we thought it was a good idea to make some sense out of the contributions, but maybe in the future we, we move into, um, into giving you direct access to the, to the form. Uh, I think uh, I think in general, more or less, we covered all the uh, the content that we wanted to to cover. So, uh, if there is no question, I think we're gonna move into what's coming up next, and then having a quick open discussion at the end. So, what's coming up? Sorry, uh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, sorry, Simon. Just a quick question. I know that we, we are in a very early stage, but in terms of uh, envisioning uh, in the validation process or the, res the, the, the research design process, how it could be, uh, how it look like in terms of testing or prototyping certain type of insight or case study. If there is anything in place or is, is something we will be doing by, by doing, like learning by doing this? What do you mean with prototyping uh, in this context? So you mentioned that probably we'll end up with a new toolkit or changing some sort of approaches to understand how ecosystem platform will impact certain organizations. So in mm -hmm. terms of uh, testing or prototyping these new approaches, there is anything in, in place that you have in mind at the moment or is something will happen later uh, by doing? I hope it is clear. Uh, well, technically, we don't have yet any specific plan. In the past, uh, we normally extended the, the toolkit uh, in, a, in a, I would say, in a rather action research way. So uh, we normally publish uh, an update of the tools that is not uh, yet uh, official. So we call it draft. So we can imagine that at the end of the white paper research, we will have, or you know, at some point in the research, I think we're going to have a separate group, for example, that is more interested in prototyping tools. And uh, we're going to have some ideas, some new tools, for example, I can think about, I don't know, governance, for example. That is a long-term absent uh, topic from our tools, uh, just uh, besides uh, a very small uh, experiment we did in 2016 with a, with a uh, canvas that was called the um, uh, the project schema uh, the platform schema sorry uh, if i'm not wrong uh, but basically you know I, I can imagine that along the way we're going to have some ideas and insights on new tools and some uh, branches of the community and the team will branch into do some prototypes and at the end of the white paper release probably going to release the white paper uh, uh, together along with uh, 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 what we can call a 3.0 version of the platform design toolkit that will be in draft. It will stay in draft for a few months, like probably three, four months, six months, and we're going to test it with customers. You're going to test it with your, your, your customers, and we're going to uh, get uh, sorry, feedback. And then at some point in the next year, probably early 2021, it will be probably consolidated in the last, uh, in the new release, you know, what we can call Platform Design Toolkit 3.0 uh, uh, stable. Um, normally, our uh, tools release are very slow. Uh, some people don't uh, like uh, <laughs> that we release uh, uh, very slowly new, new versions of the toolkit, but uh, in our experience, it's really important to not to mess the language too often. Uh, so we are very careful of adding new uh, tools um, uh, often. So, so you can imagine that this is more or less what was going to happen. Organically, we're going to come up with new uh, tools ideas and uh, maybe some small teams are going to prototype. And at the end of the process in June or September, we are going to wrap this up 
uh, maybe publish a 3.0 draft version of the toolkit and in six months, like early 2021, we're going to consolidate the, the feedbacks and the insights in, into a new release of uh, PDT. Sounds good, thanks. And yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, in general, uh, as long as uh, as we develop this relationship with you guys, uh, our team is very uh, permeable. Uh, we are always had a co a co co uh, an organization and a community that have been changing a lot of value. So I would not be, for example, surprised to see uh, some of you ending up in writing uh, uh, opinions or, or contributions in our blog and uh, maybe at the end of the process so some of you becoming actually a, a, a stable part of our uh, uh, team so 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 that's the perspective I would say uh, okay so uh, coming back to what's next uh, so we can maybe close the call a little bit earlier um, so what do we imagine now in terms of next steps? Uh, we are going to uh, uh, we are going to start a stable uh, uh, flow of uh, content. So expect more research updates. Expect more podcasting. Podcasting will probably start early April, in terms of publication, or, or maybe late March, because we have so many people that we are interviewing and so great the content that we want. We we probably going to start early on. Uh, so we're going to have these uh, community goals once in a month, uh, and so stay tuned for the uh, information coming through uh, Discord and the mailing list, um, um, and also the newsletter. Uh, then we're going to start the publishing flow, as I said, and then uh, we're going to launch a dedicated uh, website uh, page, uh, a mini website, I would say, for the white paper, where you will find all the information recapped, like you know the, the podcasting, the research updates, and uh, we're gonna launch a, uh, what we call a crowd sale uh, campaign. Uh, so it's gonna be basically about, uh, uh, you can contribute in two ways. Uh, you and of course you can um, resonate these to your network. So maybe you can find uh, companies and organization and individuals that want to contribute. That would be a community um, perk so people will be able to buy uh, fine printed versions of the white paper, but more symbolically, I would say, contributing uh, to support the research uh, with, a very, with a small amount of, uh, of, of money. And uh, uh, on the other hand, there would be what we call the Explorer package. So basically for companies or teams or organizations that want to buy uh, uh, pre-buy half a day strategic uh, remote uh, workshop that is gonna be about integrating all the insights that uh, came out of the research. Uh, so we're gonna host these half a day sessions about you know, integrating research uh, outcomes into the company strategy. Uh, so this is something that uh, you may be interested in for your company, your organization, or maybe organizations that you know may enjoy this kind of uh, um, you know, uh, possibility. And on top of that, on top of both these uh, two uh, perks, uh, there will be also the possibility to buy uh, pre-buy uh, access to our training events. So some of you already went to our trainings, so you may not be interested. But again, you can maybe suggest this to other people. And it's really important at the end of the day for us to get this uh, contribution, no? because we are investing in this research quite a lot of effort. And at the moment, as I said, uh, uh, we, we had one uh, very, uh, one very, uh, you know, one sponsor that have been, we are very happy to have, but we're looking for more. So if you know companies that may be interested in either buying one of these packages or uh, sponsoring the, the, the white paper uh, research, just, you know, reach out to let us know. Uh, and as I said, basically, uh, together with these uh, two community and explorer packages, you will be able to, uh, uh, people will be able to buy access to um, one of our training events in advance. And uh, uh, I, I anticipate that uh, at the moment, due to the coronavirus outbreak, um, uh, we, um, we're going to probably transition towards uh, only remote events for uh, at least for a while until we don't uh, understand uh, what's going to happen with live events. So uh, let me also say that in June we are, uh, in June, sorry, in the second quarter, we're going to release a self-paced uh, uh, online um, training 
which is not uh, online live like the ones that we are running now, which are live events but run online, but it will be a self-paced, chapter-based uh, process for, for learning. So, so that would be these three opportunities, uh, a remote masterclass, a remote bootcamp, and then these online self-paced. And uh, yeah, even we're going to send you the, the white paper uh, presentation. So if you want to circulate, uh, what else? Um, more or less, I think that's uh, uh, that's everything I wanted to uh, I wanted to mention. Uh, regarding your, the question on the main live training events, uh, at the moment uh, we uh, we cannot say. You know, basically our agenda for training live events uh, in real world, let's say in real life, is suspended. We're going to suspend the the event in May in Milan because there is no way that this is going to happen. And uh, uh, as soon as uh, the the situation clarifies, of course, we are going to we're going to make the agenda of the live events again, but uh, we need to understand what happens with this COVID-19 outbreak that I think uh, he, and every, every person in this call is at the moment quite <laughs> locked down at home, if I'm not wrong, uh, more or less. Maybe just uh, some people not yet in the Netherlands or, or in the UK, but uh, uh, or maybe outside of Europe, but most of Europe and the US are now under lockdown. So, so that's what we are left with. Um, that's it. Any then, you know, let's open a quick conversation. If you have uh, cons considerations, uh, uh, you know, critiques, appreciation, messages, <laughs> comments. Um, I think that uh, I'm, I'm happy to see the emphasis on your organizational forms and uh, going between public and private. I think that's fundamental. Uh, I think the whole issue of quote unquote ownership. I mean, the first platforms you mentioned were about a kind of uh, companies trying to own something that was a public process, a collaborative process and making it private. And I think what's really important in platform thinking is find, find ways that there is distribution of value. So it's the opposite of making things private. It's about making things more commons. Uh, and the, the whole intellectual property aspect is fundamental there. And I did not see the legal framework mm -hmm. in, the, in the compass. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to add this point in the compass as a, as a question. I think uh, it's also a very important uh, point. As a, general, uh, um, as a general rule, I would say as a general rule of thumb, uh, our approach to, uh, sorry, I lost view, to white paper, to the, this white paper and research in general is, uh, it tends to be uh, not, uh, uh, it's, it tends to um, focus on uh, essentially two things, which is uh, uh, assessing and foresight. Mm? So we try to live, uh, uh, I don't know, I don't want to say, you know, ideological or, or political. Uh, um, we, we tend to observe the ideological and political sphere, but not to have necessarily a, 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 a particular uh, stand. On this uh, topic, I know that, uh, and I know that you know that we <laughs> most likely we have uh, uh, opinions, but we try to, you know, describe what's happening. So, be because we want to mainly uh, frame this work as a tool for uh, uh, strategy making and sense making, so that you know that's the angle that we choose uh, when when it comes no. to this uh, this work. No, I understand the descriptive versus prescriptive, but it's also about understanding the obstacle landscape. And some yeah. of it is culture, some of it is legal, some of it is... Well, I think the, but legal, the legal aspect is, is really quite important because there's, uh, of course, a large infrastructure for both corporate and other organizational forms um, in all countries' legislations. So, yeah. you know, and, and that type of law typically gets formed after the fact, if you will. Uh, or to enable something that is uh, becoming uh, significantly apparent. So I think it's yeah. a really good question. I have another question, which is, and I don't know if it's been covered. I haven't read all of the things about 
about platform thinking, platform design, platform toolkits. But I'm of the uh, ongoing opinion for uh, quite a few years now that connected flows of information uh, and connected people, the combination of the two is what has uh, led uh, us and others to, to these points of consideration in the whole future of work arena and so on and so forth. Um, but I'm of uh, uh, yet to be, uh, uh, what, how do I want to say this? Um, I am convinced that uh, connected, continuously ongoing connected flows of information is now clearly a form of energy that when it arrives somewhere in some kind of concentration of purpose, it has the potential, of course, to, to uh, change things quickly. And we've seen many, many examples of that. Um, what I'm wondering about is what kind of thinking has gone into the notion of fluidity of organizational form uh, mm -hmm. in and on a platform. Mm -hmm. Well, that's more or less uh, part of the, um, I would say, part of the question number one. So when we talk about shifting the platform idea, what we want to understand is exactly what do we, when we use these words like platforms and ecosystem, we are describing a way bigger transition and way bigger uh, trends and shifts. So such as the ones that you are describing. So for example, in the next, uh, in the coming days, uh, we are going to interview uh, John Robb. And uh, John Robb is pretty famous in terms of the way he framed uh, um, uh, open source networks as uh, emerging governance uh, tools. Yes, he's very good. Yeah, so exactly. For example, he, he explains how uh, in the case of the coronavirus outbreak, uh, uh, essentially, for example, in the US, there was a failure of, of traditional governance and these open source networks organized uh, uh, information uh, as, a, as an upper layer of governance on top of uh, social phenomena. So I think uh, these things are on our radar for sure. And when I say, when I say, you know, we're moving from organizations into organizing, that's exactly what we're trying to understand. So yes, I, I, I get that. But I think there's such a large and perhaps only semi-conscious appetite for describing relatively stable or prescriptive types of forms. I think the people on this call probably all know um, that's um, a perhaps a foolish quest because things keep changing and more and more quickly. Uh, so it's really just, and, and that gets to the issue of, of mindsets uh, and helping platform thinking help people change their mindsets. Anyway, uh, uh, I get it. It's organizing and not organization. And also, let me take the chance to, to share our um, challenges. You know? So uh, I think that when you work on a piece of uh, work like a white paper like these, especially a white paper that wants to be a tool for sense making, a strategy making for companies and organizations, and, and I would say more generally constituencies, because we are, with this white paper, we are aiming to empower um, both commercial private organizations, uh, institutions, but also communities and teams. So we are pretty sure that the next decade of platform thinking is going to need new constituencies, new subjectivities. Okay. Yes. So what we are trying to do, we are trying to make a work that um, at some point uh, it, it needs to distill all the richness of the conversations that we are having through podcasting, through this kind of calls, to this amazing community that we have into something that is uh, understandable and, and, and can help sense making. No? So, so I think if you guys are really interested in this, you need to be part of the conversation because through the conversation, we're going to figure out how to abstract in uh, concepts, takeaways, actions, framings, sense making tools so this is the work that we want to do and we are completely conscious of the richness of the conversation that we are having at the other at the same time we are conscious that we need to uh, uh dump it down to something that is uh, usable like we did like we did with pdt no because pdt somehow is a dumping down of platform thinking 
that empowered at the moment 60,000 people in all over the world to engage with it. So that's more or less what we want to do with the, with the white paper. Great, thanks. Well, thanks for the point, John. It's, it's, it's very important. Anything else that you guys want to share? Okay. Um, so, yeah, there's a question. Yeah, um, a few, few points. Uh, one is about the, the case studies, since we are like in a moment of, uh, for, for many platforms, we will be maybe in a moment of shift, how can we approach it? So, I mean, like uh, during this crisis, I think that there will be a lot of uh, piloting and some platform maybe will collapse, some other will, will change uh, on business model. Do uh, have we ever thought about this? Uh, is something that uh, doesn't matter at this moment because we are going to study what actually they are, uh, they were until a few weeks ago, or, uh, or if there is any consideration about this point. Then other two points uh, is uh, one about the emergence. Uh, I think also quite interesting. I like how the movements are organizing. Uh, as, uh, as platforms. So if you think about extinction rebellions or uh, sunrise movements uh, or other that are uh, basically working both on the, on the learning and transaction engines. And I think that uh, will be some contributor would like to bring on the case studies. And then one point I like it a lot and I uh, would like also to explore just uh, to highlight what uh, something that, that, just to share something that I like is the regener regenerative platform thinking that I think there is a lot of space to, to explore and to, uh, and to understand if this can be like one, uh, yes, no, you're regenerative or you're not regenerative or what does it mean? Or it can be, it can be also like a, what can create, but this is just as an observation, some topic I would like to work on. So the only question I think is more about the case studies uh, approach during this moment of, uh, of social uh, piloting, I don't know what to call it. Timo, if you're speaking, you're in mute. Yeah, sorry, I lost um, your first question because I had some disturbances in the connection. So... Ah, okay. It's about case studies. We are going to collect case studies in a moment where um, many platforms will change their business model or the way mm -hmm. they are organizing. So they are pivoting because uh, basically some part of the relationship of the channel, let's say, they are going to disrupt or there will be no more uh, different needs and, and stuff like this. So how can we can we approach this fact? So we study the platform as they were before uh, two weeks ago or uh, do we have a thoughts about this or uh, each one is improvising or? Oh, well, uh, at the moment, uh, I, don't have any, I don't have any specific thought. Uh, let's uh, talk about uh, more specifically two case studies no? that we mentioned, three. One is Airbnb, one is Hire and one is Holochain. We mentioned these three case studies. Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar, but Essentially, Airbnb, I guess everybody's familiar with that. Higher Group is this Chinese company that is organized with a network of micro enterprises that is basically using this approach uh, to, do, you know, to expand the organizational structure in a very dynamic way. Uh, and then we, and it's a Chinese company uh, based in Qingdao that is not far from Yubei. And then, uh, uh, but it's an international company. And then a whole chain. So when I think about the impacts, of course, if I think about Airbnb, I don't think at the moment we can imagine a future for Airbnb as it is today, no? because uh, travel is basically uh, ha at a halt. Okay, so, uh, so yesterday I think I got a, a SAS, the Swedish company statement saying, you know, that basically flights are stopped because there is non-existent demand for travel. Okay, so for sure, if you do a case study now on Airbnb, it's going to be a bit challenging. You know, we need to really factor in what does it mean for this company in terms of business model evolution. And, you know, for, for sure, global pandemics are going to be factored into the socio-technical trends that we are going to try to frame through the value chain and value networks, as somebody has um, explained. Um, so 
we're probably going to look into this case study through the lens of uh, the transformations that we are seeing in the value chain and uh, uh, yeah, in general, some of them may be heavily disrupted. When I think about higher group, uh, you know, what is higher doing? Higher is, uh, first of all, is an organizational model. So this tends to be fairly independent to the context because it's, a, it's just a way to govern uh, and manage, organizationally speaking, people working in teams and developing new products and services. So, so this is not really, uh, uh, of course, it's going to be related to the pandemics, but uh, it's going to be maybe less impacted as a, as a case study from the very uh, basic aspects of the pandemic. Uh, and then if we think about Holochain, actually Holochain may be heavily uh, uh, favored because uh, you know, there is this idea of, in Holochain, there is this idea of locally uh, defined uh, context. So it's, uh, uh, it may be one of the tools we use to rebuild the economy in a pandemic, uh, in a, you know, this kind of uh, relocalized economy that we are, everybody is talking about now that we are appreciating the effects of supply chain disruption due to pandemics. So, you know, Guli, this is the moment we are doing the research. So there is no way, you know, we're going to uh, uh, um, overlook the pandemic. I can tell you because I'm running podcasting and, uh, uh, you know, like uh, now this is a topic of all the conversation that we have. So I don't think our work is going to be, our work, I mean, this white paper is going to be less relevant because uh, we are doing it in a moment of acceleration. In general, I think uh, I, I was talking with Bill Fisher yesterday and we shared this idea that this pandemic is going to probably push the human civilization through uh, 10 years of evolution in one year. So, uh, so it's going to be a ride for everybody, of course, for us that we are doing research. But I think at the, on the other hand, it may be a good moment to try to put together some ideas on what's going to happen in the future. So, so yeah, I, I don't think we can, as an answer, I don't think we can uh, 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 overlook that. And of course, uh, we will consider these uh, changes in and impacts when we assess uh, 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 case studies. Thanks. Uh, yeah, it wasn't, it want to be like something like this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anything, uh, anything else? Simone, can I share just a, a question, uh, an observation about the, uh, the purpose of the white paper, of course, is to give a strategic tool, but also in terms of the, the final vision is that given the businesses potentially, given also this crisis, they might be moving potentially, hopefully, towards more a purpose-driven organization. So I wonder is, in terms of case studies, uh, there might be the chance to look at or to add uh, organizations that are uh, purpose driven. So Airbnb is definitely one of the biggest uh, case study for platform, but I wonder if we can also add or analyze case studies they are focusing on the purpose where the value stream organization can really make uh, an impact. So uh, I wonder if this is a, might be part of the, the, the final purpose of the, the, the white paper or what's your view of anyone else want to add anything about this area, given that probably also moving towards uh, building product and services to building communities. So the idea of creating communities building business model also required a strategic uh, toolkit that might be also uh, part of the white paper uh, result. Uh, so I just want to uh, kind of arise this, this view and yep. see what's the feedback. Yeah, before, I mean, before you start, Simone, can I just editorialize for a moment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm obviously, from looking at all your pictures, a lot older than everybody else. Uh, <laughs> Not here. that much. And as somebody that's been working with organizations for about 35 years or so, I guess this would be probably the third time in my adult life that I've seen, all you guys are not going to like what I have to say. This is probably the third time I've seen uh, all sorts of consultants put out papers and start focusing on the purpose of an organization and purpose-driven organizations. All organizations operate on purpose. It's just that right now, most of them uh, that are corporate uh, 
you know, I mean, we're in late stage capitalism where everything has gotten distorted in terms of values. So I welcome certainly the conversation and the strategic intent. I think that there's a very, very large pent up demand and various aspects of movements around the world, whether it's B Corps or Commons or commoning and all sorts of things to redefine and reorient what we mean by purpose. But I'm, I'm very worried about the word purpose becoming sort of virtue signaling that gets uh, washed up and washed over again, just mainly because I've been paying attention for 35 years and this would be the third time I've seen it come and go, or it hasn't gone yet this time. But it's like the values driven organization, the human centric organization, all these marketing labels. I'm sorry, uh, Renzo, if uh, <laughs> that sticks in your uh, nose, but um, I'm just reflecting on the fact that I probably started hearing about purpose-driven organizations before some of you were born. I, sorry, I just want to say uh, I, I'm very aligned with what you are saying. I am fully agreed with just uh, brainwashing. Therefore, I wonder if together we can give like an impact in terms of not talking about design thinking or even if it, it's a mindset, but how can value co-creation could really be the drive of uh, innovation? So how we can definitely define value co-creation in communities, regardless of the purpose? I think that's a better way of stating something actually than just lumping it under the, the label purpose-driven. Makes it much more clear for me, I think. I can, I can share into this group, if you want, a paper I wrote about 10 years ago about co-creation as a, as a disruptor to uh, the general uh, culture of organizations these days. Um, anyway, thanks for the reinforcement, but I think it's an important question and issue. So if I can add from the editorial perspective, what we aim to do, um, so when, when we consider case studies, for example, so, so two points. One point is uh, we started this white paper research uh, from, uh, by, one, by essentially acknowledging one, one big point. And the big point is that we had to integrate an higher order of complexity in the theory of platforms. So what does it mean? First, first of all, you can, the, the, we acknowledge that there was no more the idea of you know, tooling an organization. We are actually tooling a, a civilization now with this white paper. So we want to do it. We want to approach the whole on that is around the organizations. So it's no more just about strategy, but it's about uh, framing strategy into a more civilization level uh, understanding of what's going on. Okay. So that's why, for example, we are we are factoring in risk factors, shifts in culture. So all these things. Uh, uh, and, and we are looking at all these things through the lens of value chains. Why? Because the value chain defines what is, uh, 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 what is uh, uh, first of all, desirable from an organizational perspective, what is needed, what is achievable. So we believe is, uh, 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 we, what we believe is that uh, the organizational model is changing because the contour, the, the context of organizing is changing. And it's changing in terms of technologies, biosphere, and culture. So when you see these three axes, is the, let's say these three axes represent the context of organizing. So what we want to do, we want to make an exercise of trying to understand how the context of organizing is changing so that we can, access, we can do some foresight on how organizing will change, okay? Then, uh, uh, when it comes to understanding what uh, case study is uh, uh, significant and what case study we want to acknowledge, I think I want to use the rule of thumb that, again, I'm going to quote again Indy Johar, but once Indy said, uh, uh, you know, basically all these social innovations and impact and purpose and so on needs to go out of the uh, corner shop uh, dimension. So we need to understand, you know, uh, relevant organizations that are really having a, I don't want to say having an impact, but they have a tangible presence. They are real projects. So that's, come, that comes back to the, the, the conversation we had before. When do you add a case study? Try, let's try to add case studies that are highly significant, either in terms of uh, 
at the real uh, unfolding in the world. Like, you know, for example, if I think about, uh, I don't know, Burzorg. No, Burzorg is a, quite an interesting organization. It's a wide uh, organization. It's a lot of impact, lots of people involved. So it's really something tangible. But on the other hand, we don't want to uh, overlook uh, organizations which are uh, bringing some relevant ideas and maybe not yet unfolding into reality. No? So that's more or less uh, my, my, my feedback to these two points. Makes, makes sense to me when I've, uh, in my working definition of hierarchy, the last part of it, I changed a few years ago from focus on results to generating social and economic value. Mm -hmm. When you talk about value, value chain, uh, I also think it's really, really important to, if we're talking about ecosystems and biosphere and culture, to define it as both social and economic value. And that brings to mind something I don't, you know, maybe I'm older, view it differently, but it seems to me, would IKEA maybe be a, an interesting case study? I think they're a platform organization. Maybe I don't know much about their technology, but I think they're very active in um, generating or supporting social value in many ways through their supplier network, through their design network, through their leadership in sustainability, and uh, ecological considerations. Anyway, just a cur uh, curious question. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, when it comes to value chain, uh, choosing to look through the value chain, I think uh, um, we uh, have chosen a, a rigorous, a rather rigorous approach to analyzing value chain, and uh, based on some worldly maps, worldly maps. And uh, yeah, for example, when I, when I hear about uh, the need to move from value chain to value networks, these are all very good ideas. But at the end of the day, we need a tangible approach. We need something that has the capability to describe what's happening and to give us tools to understand how things are evolving. And we found this, uh, 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 we have found worldly maps a, a very powerful way to describe uh, uh, perception of uh, of uh, value. No, so for example, I believe that uh, when you have a, a perception shift, like a cultural shift, or you have a massive uh, new risk, you have a change in value perception, and this reflects into the value chain. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if uh, you have uh, uh, you know massive climate risks, people will perceive uh, uh, resilience to climate impacts as a value, and then they can start thinking about new forms of organizing. So, so that kind of ways of uh, framing value that I think is going to be helpful. Uh, and when it comes to IKEA, that's a good point. Uh, we, uh, we are also in conversation with IKEA and uh, they're doing some interesting work. So most likely this is going to be uh, an interesting case study. In general, when we look into uh, corporate case studies, it may be two types. There may be a case study in how, for example, companies have transformed themselves into platforms, a la Ayer Group or IKEA, which is more a franchise at the moment, but I would say, you know, go in this direction. And on the other hand, there may be more about how they embed the, the design practice of platforms and ecosystem thinking in their innovation process. For example, what ING has been doing, which is less a platform as an organization, but it has apparently integrated a lot of platform thinking into what they I want to deal with innovation and, and new business. Thank you. Okay, so I think more or less we are uh, we are finishing our our time. Uh, I think uh, that was a very fruitful conversation and uh, rather long for people that want to on board, but <laughs> that's more or less how it takes. So um, that's it. I mean, expect, uh, uh, so my message is expect news in the coming weeks. We're going to ramp up the research and uh, stabilize it. I would like to really see you more often into our community sense making calls, but most importantly on the discourse, if you really want to contribute, we're going to have a rather uh, uh, interactive conversation on that, uh, on that uh, tool. And uh, that's it. I mean, uh, I'm really thankful to, uh, for having you all uh, here and uh, uh, looking forward uh, to speak to you soon and communicate with you through the, through the channels we just mentioned. 
And uh, yeah, I want to fi finish on a, on a, on a uh, optimistic uh, note. So and, and you know, try to hold on and uh, stay strong uh, under lockdown. Uh, hopefully, we're going to uh, to through this soon, and uh, this all uh, this uh, shall uh, pass as well. So so you know, um, keep going. <laughs> Thank you guys. Talk Thank to you. you. Talk to you soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye, bye. Bye, bye. Bye, bye. Thank you. Bye. Grazie mille. Bye. Grazie a te.